Hey everybody, Milton Davis here. Um, happy Black History Month. Um, of course, you know around here, Black History Month is uh, 360, Black History is 365, but I'm glad that we choose a month out of every year to celebrate and concentrate on, on Black History in America and around the world. Um, you know, history is something that's very uh, important to me. Um, I'm a big history buff. Um, most of what I write is based on history. So what I wanted to do is kind of go through my history book collection. I pulled out a few books that are unique to me, some that are like special to me. And um, so I wanted to kind of show these books to you and uh, give you a little background on them. And hopefully you might want to go and check them out and take a look for them, look at them for yourself. Um, the first book I want to talk to you about, I'll give you some background on this one. Um, this was when I was actually working as a salesperson and I was in the Charleston area looking for a particular customer. And I find that customer. But as I was put, I put on the side of the road and as I was like trying to check my, and this was back in the day of map quest and all that kind of stuff. So as I'm looking at my maps, I see that I'm near this historical marker. And I look at the historical marker and it says like, this is the place of the Stono Rebellion. And I had never heard of the Stono Rebellion. And basically the Stono Rebellion was something that took place in the in the colony of South Carolina. This was before um, America, basically. And it was a situation where um, there was a revolt. It was a slave revolt there. And during that time, there were more black people living in South Carolina than it was, you know, um, Europeans. And it actually changed the entire spectrum of how um, the colonies were handled at that point. Um, this is the particular book right here I'm talking about. Um, and after I saw that particular sign, I said, hey, I need to check this out. So I bought this book and it gave a really good history and explanation about this. And this was, a, a, again, this was history that I wasn't familiar with, but just by that, just by chance, pulling the side of the road, looking at a historical marker, um, I found out about this. And it was a very enlightening book um, to teach me more about uh, history of America before America became a country and stuff like that. So one of the things that this brings up too is that I find out a lot of times when I'm looking for history books that it's very um, it's it's a it's a good thing to check out local history books, local um, monuments in in particular cities because sometimes they have books written about the local history by local people, and these are books that you won't normally find if you're looking in your libraries or you're looking online and stuff like that. One of those books is this book here called Black Society in Spanish Florida. I happened to be in the Fort at St. Augustine and I'm looking through their books and I came across this. And before that time, I did not know that before, um, I could say before um, the now after the revolutionary period, uh, when um, enslaved Africans would escape, they would go south. They would go to Florida because at the time, Spain did not recognize slavery and particularly did not recognize British slavery. So a person, if they were lucky enough and could get to Florida, they could basically um, they would have like a, a, a period of a, an indentured period. And then they would basically be freed. Now, the English and the British knew that the people would go there and they would come to Spanish Florida and they would try to petition to get their slaves back. And the Spanish people were like, oh, yeah, right. Anyway, and they would kind of kind of ignore. Them. One of the reasons was because Florida was actually a poor colony. Uh, Florida wasn't like some of the other colonies that the Spanish that the Spanish controlled, and they were always in need of labor and different things like that. And they was always in need for colonists. So whenever um, uh, enslaved Africans would escape and come there, they would basically embrace them. And one particular story, which I say one day I'm going to write about, is about a particular person that escaped. Um, actually became a very prominent person. Ended up being the leader of the black militia in St. Augustine, um, one of the founders of Fort Mose, which is something that I found out about from this book. And this this gentleman became so famous and important that he actually went to Spain to petition to be knighted because of stuff that he had done for the colony of St. Augustine. So this was like some fascinating history that I found out in just from this book here. Okay, let's move up a little bit in our historical our historical ladder. Um, I have spent a lot of time vacationing in the Hilton Head area. And for most of that time, um, we basically just spent with our kids. We go to the beach, hang out and stuff like that. You know, I love the area. I love the low country. I love the marshland. But as the kids got older and my wife and I started traveling on our own, we really started to explore the history 
of the area. And that's how we found out how significant that history is. Um, that was one of the first areas liberated during the Civil War back in 1862, it was claimed. And during that time, um, the Union forces that, um, that liberated the area started to train the former enslaved Africans on how to, how to live life beyond slavery. And this basically happened in the Hilton Head area. One of the first, the first mandatory public school was set up in that area, and it was set up to make sure that you know free um, enslaved Africans were educated and stuff. And so there's a lot of information when you go to that area about the history in the different, um, like in the, uh, the the Hilton Head historical um, community. There's a lot of local books written about that history, and there's also a lot of books about Gullah culture. Um, I have two books that I picked up in that area. Um, this one is called. Uh, Gullah for you, which basically talks about the Gullah language and t and tells you different phrases and terms and different things like that. And I also have um, this book called uh, Gullah Legacies, which I picked up in the area that tells you more about the culture and the people there. And it's very both books are very interesting. Uh, again, this is these are books that were bought locally, books that I wouldn't normally find anywhere else. That was that's done by local authors, and most communities do a really good job at collecting books in their um, I guess say in their um, Tourist, um, tourist centers and stuff like that. They do a very good job at collecting books by local authors about their particular areas and culture. Um, moving up a little bit further, <laughs> um, I was doing some research for one of the books that I was writing. Matter of fact, it's the one that is going to be coming out too, um, uh, The Curious Cases of Martha Periwinkle. And I wanted to understand more about um, black society in New York during the 1870s and things like that. And I found this book called Black Gotham. And this book basically talks about life in New York City for black people. And it gave me some very interesting um, details. And one of the things I found out that was really interesting was that when the show The Gilded Age came out and they started talking about some of the references that they used, one of the references that they used was this book, Black Gotham. I knew it when I saw it because when they when they talked about the black woman character that her father was a pharmacist, he's basically he's loosely based on a black pharmacist that actually actually lived in New York during that time. And so it's a perfect it was a perfect way to show um, some of the black culture in, you know, in New York, how successful they were. But at the same time, some of the challenges that they dealt with, you know, which we always dealt with during that time and even now. Um, Another book that um, I that I purchased that told me about something about history that I didn't really understand and I didn't know about was we all know about Reconstruction and we know about how it failed and we know how black people responded to it. And one part of that was that people left the South. Um, they basically did not want to deal with what was happening. They didn't want to talk to them. They didn't want to be dealing with any of that kind of stuff like that. Um, so they left the South. And this particular book here, um, In Search of Canaan, um, Black migration to Kansas, 1879 to 1880, is one of those situations. These people were actually called exodusters. And what happened was that there were people, there were black people who went out west and bought land. And they came back and they talked to black people who were still living in the south and said, hey, we've got some land out here at west. You can come out here. You can live. You don't have to worry about Jim Crow. You don't have to worry about any of that kind of stuff like that. And people did. And it, it became to be so many people were leaving and going to this area that actually some of the white people in the South were traveling out there to see where everybody was going. And you had to, and you couldn't just pick up and leave. A lot of these people were sharecroppers and they were basically in a situation where they were just building more and more debt. And so what they would do, they would kind of like leave in portions. They would say, OK, we're going to go visit so and so. We're going to go visit that that person. And eventually enough of them would be gone to where they can actually travel to Kansas and and settle in. And this was the first time that I was um, that I learned about something like this and read something like this. So this is another book that you can see is kind of worn, <laughs> but it's another book that I consider an important book in my collection. So let's move on. <laughs> this book is not particularly about. Um, America per se, but it is. Um, and this is another piece of history that I stumbled upon when I was doing research for a book. Um, I was doing actually research for the second book in my 10 book two um, series, La Rosa de Montanzas. And I had imagined <laughs> a Cuban revolution during the, 18, during the 1870s for my story. 
But then as I started reading and doing research, I found out there actually was a revolution there. And the, the, the circumstances of that revolution eventually led to the Spanish-American War. But one of the most important things that I found out when I was looking at this research is I discovered a man by the name of Antonio Maceo. And he was known as, let me find it here, the Bronze Titan. Um, Antonio was one of the major generals in this revolution against Spain during the 1870s and, 1870s and the 1880s. And some of his exploits um, were considered on the same level of tactics that Napoleon used during his war. Um, this was a man who was fighting against um, a, a well-armed Spanish army. And a lot of times it was just basically him and his troops and they had machetes. And that was it. But he was known for his mobility tactics. He was known for um, being a, a very brave person. Um, he was actually eventually killed in battle. But during the time that he was alive and he was commanding the forces, he was very well known. And actually when the Americans... Um, start to come into Cuba after the Spanish-American War, they saw a lot of things of praises about him, about Antonio Maceo and what he had done during that particular Cuban Revolution. So somebody, and I mean, I was so impressed by it that I had to go back and re rewrite my story. I said, I got to put this man in this book because I'm just so impressed by what he does. And there's no way I can write about this, even if it's alternate history and not include Antonio Maceo in it. So that's what I did. There's one person that I've been talking about a lot lately. Um, there's a graphic novel that just came out about him. Um, and this is um, Eugene Bullard. Um, Eugene Bur Bullard is close to my heart because he's originally from Columbus, Georgia. Um, he was the first World War I, black World War I pilot. Um, he flew for the French. Um, he won numerous awards from the French. Um, after the war, he owned a club where most of some of the most famous um, black jazz artists hung out during that time. Um, during the um, during he actually was uh, he actually worked with the French Resistance during World War II. Um, eventually, had to flee the country because the Germans became uh, hip to what he was doing. And uh, we also know that in the end, um, uh, when he came to America, um, he was actually. Um, he was found because of the fact that Charles de, Ca Charles de Gaulle came to America um, on a trip and asked for asked to see him. And Americans had no idea who he was. They sent the FBI to look for him, found him working as an elevator man in New York. And um, he actually told his story from that st standpoint. There's a current graphic novel out about him right now called um, Now Let Me Fly, in which I've read, and it's a very good book. Um, but these are some of the books that I purchased um, before hand one was this one um eugene bullet the first black fighter pilot and this other one um eugene bullet um black expatriate in jazz age paris there are also some other books about him as well um and he actually was writing his own autobiography that he never completed um for you people that live in columbus i i heard that there actually is the, in, the incomplete manuscript is actually at the columbus public library um, I don't know what you have to do to get access to it, but um, it is there. And I have one more book I want to talk about. And this gentleman is actually, um, in many ways, a contemporary of uh, Eugene Bullard. Um, i got to give a little background on this first. Um, we all know about horse racing and stuff like that. But what some of us don't know is that in the early years of horse racing, most of the, well, all of the jockeys were black. And that's the reason why you see the infamous jockey stands in some front of some some people's homes, because most of the jockeys were back, black. Um, they began to be replaced when being a horse jockey became a lucrative profession. And one of the gentlemen who was very successful at that was a gentleman by the name of Jimmy Winkfield. And he was known as Wink. And the reason that Wink's story is so imp is so interesting is because um, he was a, a again he was a jockey and he was doing very well successful. But then he lost a few races and his um, the, the, his uh, boss got tired of it and fired him. So Wink actually traveled to Europe and he went to France. And this was like somewhere around the World War One. Um, this was like around the World War One area before World War One. And he started racing horses there and he became very successful. And he eventually ended up going to Russia, where he was also um, racing horses there. Now, of course, Russia was involved in, in uh, World War I, and then there was a Bolshevik Revolution. Um, Winkfield was considered a white Russian, um, the, the aristocrats. So when 
the um, government fell, they were searching for people like him. So he got with his other people, other Russian friends, and they made their way out of Russia. And the only reason they were able to escape was because the way that the Bolsheviks would check people to see whether they were white Russians or not was they would look at they would look at their hands. And because most of them didn't do any labor, any hard work, their hands wouldn't be calloused and different things like that. But because of Jimmy Winkfield and other people working with the horses trying to get out, their hands looked kind of callous and rough. So people were like, okay, these guys must be cool. We'll let them go. So he ended up leaving Russia. Okay, let me go back. He went up re leaving Russia, and that's where he ended up in France and began racing horses there and was very successful. And he would have been a contemporary, actually, of Eugene Bullard. But then World War II happened. And he had to get out of the country just like everybody else. And he did get out of the country and eventually come back to America. And when he got back to America, he bought a couple of horses and he began horse racing again and became successful again. So, it's again, it's a, it's a fascinating story that kind of parallels the life of Eugene Bullard and happened at the same time. And it's one of those things that we don't normally hear about because, you know, that's how that's how our history is. So, um I went through this kind of quickly, but, you know, I just wanted to make sure just give you guys a few examples of some of the books that I have in my library, um, particular ones that were unique, that were unique, um, that uh, I felt like were different than what I was normally learning as far as um, from a historical standpoint. Um, I see where Cynthia asked a question if I could supply the, the titles and the authors of the books, and I will. Um, as I, after, Once I finish this video, I will basically put them up on this on the comment section so you guys can take a look at them yourself. And I also keep a bibliography of um, my books because from time to time I get people asking me about my books and my sources and stuff like that, and, and I'm more than happy to share them. Um, there's so much out there now. Um, it seems like the interest in, in uh, black history comes in waves and sometimes so you get books from a certain time period um, like during the um, 60s there were a lot of history books coming out during the 90s there were a lot of history books coming out and so it kind of goes back and forth so I'm always on the lookout for new books to give us uh, give me more a better perspective and more information about not only black history in the United States and and in the Afro-Caribbean world but throughout the world as well and stuff. So that's basically what I'm looking for there. Again, um, we are celebrating Black History Month. Um, if you go to my website, you will see that we have uh, our Sword and Soul and Steam Funk books on sale. Um, those are the books that are mostly influenced by Black History and the research that I've done in history. So go check those out. See something that you like, you know, pick one up. We'll always be grateful for that. And uh, that's about it. So you guys take care. Have a great day. Peace.